My next guest on Portable Magic has been dynamited while scuba diving. She's also been arrested while busking, which doesn't say much for her singing skills, really, but we'll find out about that. She's also trekked through New Guinea searching for a soldier. She writes fantasy trilogies and picture books. In fact, Picture Book, her first picture book, won the 2020 Patricia Wrightson Award, the Premier's Award in New South Wales. She's also got a brand new e out called Clue for Clara. Very delighted to welcome Lee and Tanner. Lee and how are you? I'm really well, thank you, Sue. And thank you for having me on, on your program. It's an absolute pleasure. Now, I don't really know where to start, whether I should start with awards, fantasies or um, New Guinea, but I'm going to start with scuba diving. What happened? How did you get dynamited? Oh, oh look, uh, I, I lived in Papua New Guinea for three years uh, in my early 20s and I was teaching up there. I was teaching at a little bush school and I had friends who ran a, uh, a shell diving business. So, so they, uh, a friend was trying to set up, the, the Papua New Guinean government had asked him to set up a shell export business because the shells up there are amazing. And um, so he taught me to scuba dive. And I would sometimes go, go diving with him and his friends when they would go looking for shells. So one day we were about 100 metres down and we, did, we had a boat up above, but nobody in the boat. We had flags on the boat to show that, you know, there were divers down below. And uh, so we were about 100 metres down and there was this... It's really hard to describe it because it wasn't really a sound because we were so far underwater. It was, it was more like being hit by a truck. It was, it was this massive um, percussion of water. And I had no idea what had happened. Uh, my friend Brian, he realised really quickly and he pointed upwards and, and made paddling motions and we started to swim up. And there were dead fish all around us. There, were, there was a, a dying turtle over there and a dying baby shark over there. And we we just swam we just swam for our lives you know we would normally have stopped um to decompress at least once on our way up from from um sorry not 100 meters down 30 meters down i'm thinking getting the the feet and the, the meters mixed up um so we would normally have stopped to decompress but we just we just swam up as fast as we can because brian had realized what had happened he'd figured out it was dynamite and um and he knew that if it happened again it could very well kill us so we swam up and up and it was a fisherman's um fishing with dynamite which people did occasionally around there which is of course an absolutely appalling way to fish because you kill everything mm. uh including the things that you're not going to eat and um we we burst out of the surface of the water and there's this bloke he must have seen us coming up through the water because he was paddling away as fast as he could and we we never knew who did it uh, but we we were deaf for days. We it was the most extraordinary ex extraordinary experience. Oh, terrifying! Now, what about the busking? Why did you get arrested? Was it your voice? Was it you? Was it the choice <laughs> it of wasn't my voice. It wasn't <laughs> my voice. Um, I used to. This is in Hobart. I used to be in a band called the Ovarian Sisters, and um, and we sang kind of feminist folk, and. At one stage, and, and it was legal to busk in the mall in Hobart, until at one stage the police, the, the council decided that they were going to make it illegal. I don't know if the shopkeepers had complained or quite what it was, but they decided they were going to make it illegal. And we protested. So as soon as it was, as it was illegal, we went into the mall and started busking. And a couple of police came up and I was on the end. So this policeman said to me, excuse me, you're, what you're doing is against the law please leave the mall. So I thought, okay, I'm not quite sure what to do here. And he took my arm and led me out of the mall. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll just watch here and see what happens. So then the other policeman said to my friends, the other people in the band need you to leave the mall. And they said, no. So they got arrested and the divvy van came up and they started being put in the divvy van. And I thought, oh no, my friends are going without me. So I raced back into the mall and said, you told me not to come back or I'd been arrested. Look, here I am, you have to arrest me. So they stuck me in the back of the van with my friends. 
Lynn, I have heard some lame um, arrest stories, but that one takes a cake that you <laughs> volunteered for arrest. <laughs> Volunteering for arrest, yes. Um, so we were we were carted off to the lockup and held there for a few hours and then then let go. And eventually we went to court and it was thrown out of court. Oh, and goodness. in the meantime, there had been such a massive protest that the council actually changed the laws and made it legal to busk again. So it was it was a it was a really useful thing to do. <laughs> really interesting, great fodder for writing too. To oh, be arrested. Yes. Oh yes, mind you, the um, the the dynamite one was also a fantastic fodder for writing because I actually used that not not completely directly, but. Um, the second book in my hidden series was called Sunk as Deep, and it was about these people who live on submarines. And I used that experience very, very strongly in this description of people getting, of this little, tiny little submarine getting depth charged. Uh, so, you know, all this stuff, it comes in handy. It really does. Now, you came to writing quite late in life. You were on another track, really, weren't you? I came to publishing quite late in life. I, I think I've written all my life. You know, I was one of those kids who, who writes story after story after story. I, I used to write plays and take them to school and, and make my classmates perform in them. Um, so I was, I was writing from when I was really young, uh, really bad poetry, um, stories about horses, always about horses. Um, but I think one of the thing that, things that happens as you grow up, you, you kind of, it's really easy with life and boyfriends and school and work. It's really easy, I think, when you hit your teens to start losing track of the things that you're actually really passionate about. And that's one of the things that happened to me. Um, so I, I still wrote, but it was this kind of background thing. You know, it was just something to writing writing stuff for my friends birthdays and things like that and so then i went on and did a whole stack of other jobs including going to papua new guinea to be dynamited <laughs> and um and and i taught and i i did that classic writer thing you know where i've had 50 different jobs sort of none of which i settled to and then when i was in my late or mid 30s i um i studied drama i did a, a two-year associate diploma of drama and as part of that, I started writing again. And I started writing for the stage. And then I worked as an actor for three years and wrote for this little theatre and education company that I was working for. And that was what got me back into it. So uh, it was after I left the theatre and education company that I started mucking around with all different sorts of writing, you know, sort of trying to work out, well, what is it that I want to do? Do I want to do freelance journalism? Do I want to write? short stories for the Women's Weekly, do I want to write incredibly pretentious adult novels. Um, so I did a bit of all this stuff, uh, but the stuff I actually really liked doing was writing children's stories. So I, I wrote uh, a number of children's stories for School Magazine in New South Wales, and they were accepted, which, and you know, success is always a, a great thing for making you do more. Good and then one of those stories, yeah. Uh, and one of those stories gradually became a novel and that was what got me started, yeah. What was your first novel? My first novel was a little book called Rats uh, and it was published by Lothian Books and it was, a, it was a contemporary story, a contemporary funny story. I kind of, I, talk, I, I call it my practice book because I, I wrote it to see if I could get published. I wrote it and I wrote it in a voice that was not really my natural writing voice, but that was uh, a voice that I thought would work, you know, that, that, that I thought would be acceptable for, for a publisher. And um, so it was kind of fast and funny and, and it worked okay. And, and I got it published. And so when I'd done that and I thought, okay, I've proved to myself that I can get published, then I sat back and I thought, okay, what do I actually want to write? And what I actually wanted to write was fantasy. Um, and that was when I started writing Museum of Thieves. And that was my voice. That was, I, I wrote that as me. What drew you to fantasy? Was it something you think you were always going to do? Or was it something about kids' oh. fantasy? I love fantasy. I have always loved fantasy. I love reading it and I love writing it. And I love 
I, I don't, I'm, I'm not so mad on that, that high concept heroic fantasy with, with princes and queens and dragons and all that sort of stuff. I like what I call low fantasy, which is kind of a world that just deviates slightly from ours and, and where people are living fairly ordinary lives, but there is this extra element to it uh, that is such fun to write. So that that is that is enormously appealing to me. Yeah. Do you have a favourite um, fantasy book that you've read, either recently or in the past, that you just go, you nailed oh, it. That is a great fantasy. Look, I grew up on the Narnia books, uh, and also on Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book. So they were both, I, I think they both had a huge influence on me as a child. Uh, and I still, I, I haven't read them for years, but I, I remember them enormously fondly. Um, so I can't offhand think about, uh, think of a fantasy that I've read recently that has that same impact, but there are some amazing fantasy stories around at the moment. You know, there, there are some, both for children and for adult, adults. Um, Oh, N.K. Jemison, who, who writes extraordinary fantasy for adults. Uh, and there's some wonderful stuff around for kids too. So uh, back when I was a kid, there were a few. Um, Diana Wynne-Jones was the other person who I discovered when I grew older. And, and her books, one of her books, The Power of One, which is for children, is a book that, sorry, The Power of Three, not, not one, that's, what's his name? That's Russell, Bryce. Of, yes, The Power of Three. Um, Diana Wynne Jones is a book that I actually reread every couple of years because it is such a beautiful, beautiful story. Mm. There's a new one out, have a look at, actually it's a couple of years old, called Beyond the Raggedy Witches. I think you'd love that. Oh, Set yes. Island. Oh, How yes. good is that? Isn't that amazing? I Isn't love it? That. As you were talking about that real world and the just outside, mm. I kept thinking of the creek where she crosses the creek. The third one, and that's just come out, I can't wait. <laughs> I haven't read the second one. I, I, I'm, I'm, the second one's out already, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I haven't yeah. read that. But, I mean, I would read it for the title alone. What mm. a brilliant title. Oh, she had me right from the start when the little girl's in the car and the, I just went, oh, I'm in, this is beautiful. This is yeah. lovely. Yeah. So, but your latest two books aren't fantasy. Well, Clara kind of is. But <laughs> you've had a bit of a twist. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, my latest book, which is a clue for Clara, it on the surface of it, it's not a fantasy in that it's set in a small Australian country town and it's contemporary and there's a 11-year-old kid in it, you know, who's just an Australian country kid. Uh, the fantasy element comes in that that's part of it is told from the point of view of a chook. <laughs> so there's this little chook called Clara who is small and scruffy and desperately wants to be a detective. So part of the story is her diary uh, and part of the story is told from the friend of the human girl who she, from the point of view of the human girl who she befriends, whose name is Olive. So it's, it's not your standard fantasy, but it's not exactly realistic either. <laughs> Now, every book has its um, challenges, I guess, to put it nicely when you're writing them. What was Clara's challenge? What was the thing that oh, you kept butting up against? The hardest thing was to find Clara's voice. The hardest thing was to find the voice that I wanted to write the story in. So I had this idea about a chook who wants to be a detective. And as soon as I thought of the idea, it made me laugh. And so I knew that it was, you know, I knew that it was a really interesting idea. But I absolutely could not find my way into the story. I didn't, I wasn't quite sure who was telling the story, whether it was being told from the girl Olive's point of view, uh, or, or that was sort of where I started off and it just didn't quite have the zing to it that I, that I felt the story needed. Um, and then I hit upon the idea of Clara the Chook keeping a diary and and I'm still not entirely sure whether the diary is completely in her head or whether she's got little scraps of paper tucked away <laughs> under her wings somewhere but once I had this idea that you know she had taught herself the time to tell the time by human standards and so she she marked off her day uh, in 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 proper times and she was keeping this diary and once I had that 
uh, her voice came to me really strongly and really clearly. And from then on, it was an absolute joy to write. When I, when I started writing it, I, I actually intended to tell the whole thing in, um, in Clara's voice. I thought that the whole thing would be the diary. And I showed the first few chapters to my publisher at Alan and Unwin, Anna McFarlane. And she said, look, I'm not sure whether the, whether the diary, whether the Chook's voice will sustain for the whole book. And I thought, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about. <laughs> and then, of course, I got to a certain point in the book and I thought, oh, I really need Olive's voice to come in here. So, of course, she was completely right. And I um, ended up having a mix. Clara's voice is, the diary is sort of runs for about the first third of the book. And then Olive's voice comes in and she is writing a letter to her mother who died a, years, uh, a year ago. So we've got these two, two very different voices uh, telling the story. Now, what about Ella? Because, again, she's your first picture book and quite a spectacular, beautiful book. Yes. Tell us about Ella. Yes. Um, Ella, Ella in the Ocean. Uh, I started writing Ella, oh, gosh, um, at least 12 years ago and probably more. If I look back through my notebooks, there's a note that probably goes back to about 15 years ago mm -hmm. that just says... Uh, a child who has never seen the ocean and how does she imagine it? And, and that was this idea that came to me. And I, and I, and I had this, this vague thought of her parents trying to describe it to her, her mother saying, you know, like, it's like your, your blue hair ribbon. Uh, and that was as far as I got because I had no idea how to write a picture book. I didn't have the skills and I, and I didn't know where to go with it. So that sat in that idea sat in my notebook for quite a few years um, about 12 years ago I got it out and started playing around with the idea more and I, I I had a few more ideas about what they could liken it to and and her father saying you know it was as flat as the land between here and the hills and her brother saying it's as wild as the wild horses but I still and, and I and I wrote a couple of drafts of it back then but I still, I, I, I couldn't make it work. I, I didn't know enough about picture books, basically. Uh, I didn't understand how much space you have to leave in picture books. Um, and this was, this was one of, uh, this is one of the things that really interests me about picture books, because I wrote for theatre for a little while. I wrote for this little theatre company I was working for, and I wrote for Terrapin, which was, which is Tasmania's puppet theatre. And one of the things I learnt from writing for them is that you have to leave space for the actors. You know, if you're, if you're writing a script, you don't write down everything. You, you don't write all the stage directions. You, you don't write actors saying, I am so happy. You know, you, you have to leave room for the actor to bring their own interpretation and the director to bring their own interpretation. And it took me a while to realise that it was the same with picture books, that you haven't, it's not the words tell a story and the pictures tell the same story. It's that the words and the pictures t come together to, to tell this story. So it took me a while to figure that out. And then I, about, probably about three years ago, I, I, got this, um, I got the manuscript out of this dark and dusty <laughs> corner of my computer and, uh, and started reworking it. And I realised that I knew so much more and I did actually know how to do it. So started working it. Um, did another another ten drafts, and um, and then submitted it. I uh, gave it to my agent, who loved it, uh, and she submitted it to my public to Alan and Unlan, and they loved it, and it was all it was all on from there. And then, of course, well, who else loved it? We have to oh, brag. Well, a, a couple of people actually. Um, one of the things my publisher did was they sent me a list of illustrators, and they said we think any of these would work well for you, uh, have a look at them and then put them in order, you know, to tell us which, which order you want, because you never get the first one. Illustrators are always so busy, you never get the one you want most. So I looked at them and, I, and one of them was Jonathan Bentley and I looked at Jonathan Bentley's work and I thought, oh, this is so beautiful. So, you know, my list of the order I wanted people in was number one, Jonathan Bentley, number two, Jonathan Bentley, number three, Jonathan <laughs> Bentley. So... 
Um, I sent this off to my publishers and they approached him and he luckily loved the manuscript too. So he agreed to take it on with these beautiful illustrations. So then it won the New South Wales Premier's Literary Award for Children, um, which was the most extraordinary thing to happen in this very strange year, you know, when, when we're all trying to work out how we get a bit of publicity, how we get people to look at our books, how we get people to notice our books. And, and suddenly there was this absolutely wonderful award, which was just the most, ex most exciting thing. Congratulations. It, yeah, it is. It's just fabulous. And I love too that that picture book took so long to write because writing isn't a here's an idea, here's the finished manuscript, is it? No, no. And, and I think particularly with picture books, um, non-writers often underestimate how long they take to cook and how long they take to write because, you know, like this has got 80 words in it, something like that, not much more. Um, and, and yet to hone those words down, uh, with a novel, you can afford to have a few words out of place. You can afford to have some wasted words. Uh, but in a picture book, it's like, it's more like a poem. You, you, you mm. have to hone it down until every word uh, earns its place. So, and I think that's what takes so long. Mm. So Liam, what's next? For you because when people have their books come out they're always halfway through another project or finishing off a project yeah. what are you doing with your writing at the moment well look it's uh, as you know it's been a fairly strange mm -hmm. year um i've had a number of false starts this year so i'm not very far along with anything uh i i think i've tried three times to to get started on something that i thought would work and fallen flat on the face with it so what, I'm, what I've actually come to now is a follow-up to Clara. Uh, and that's, you know, moderately risky to be working on because I don't have a contract for it and I've no idea how Clara's going to go. Uh, but it was the book that wanted to be written at this stage. So I'm doing a follow-up. Uh, Clara, Cla I should point out that you're probably fairly obvious that Clara is going to be funny. You, know, <laughs> uh, you, you don't write a deathly serious book about a, a chook who wants to be a detective. And so, not with that gorgeous face either. She's got cheek no, written all this over. Is a gorgeous cover. This is, this is Cheryl Orsini who did this cover. She, she did the illustrations inside it and she did this absolutely beautiful cover, which I'm completely in love with. Uh, so I thought, okay, I'd, I'd really like to do a follow up. And one of, there's a running joke through this book about ducks uh, uh, because one of the things Clara says fairly early on is uh, ducks are, everyone knows that ducks are mad and then there's this kind of <laughs> there's, there's this running joke where somebody says I'm going mad and Clara says you are not a duck so um, <laughs> I thought what if the ducks get wind of this um, and the second book is told from the point of view of a duck who wants to get revenge on this chook who's causing them to be mocked. So that's the story I'm writing now. That's hilarious. All I can see is my sister's ducks who are as mad as cut snakes. And one of they them- They are mad, aren't they? They're <laughs> completely mad ducks. She left the pen and lived on the dam. I don't know how she survived the foxes for something like three months. Christmas day, she flew across back to the pen. That'll do me, thank you very much. Mad. <laughs> Just yeah. mad yeah crazy animals lena it's been so lovely to talk to you good luck with the um the duck but more particularly with clara who's out right now and if you haven't seen ella make sure you have a look at ella in the ocean it is exquisite thank you so much for joining us today thank you sue it's been lovely to talk to you it really has oh look i've got one last question did okay. you find the um soldier in the jungle no, oh, no, I don't damn. think he was ever actually there. I, I, I don't think he was there. So we never found him, no. Good, I like to tie up all my ends. <laughs> Liam, thank you so very much. Thanks, Sue.